Hello class. Today is February the 2nd, 2021, the year of COVID. Uh, my hair looks great, doesn't it? Uh, anyway, uh, we're not running a beauty contest here. Uh, I'm going to go over the unit one study guide, one of two, and then I'm going to make another video to make a study guide, uh, a video about study guide two. The reason I'm going over the study guide is because if if we were face to face then I would be lecturing about this so a lot of you may not understand what I'm asking for in the study guide when you're doing your reading if you don't do your reading you're not going to be able to answer these questions and if you can't answer these questions and you're not going to do well on the on well on the exam right so the question here is going to be, uh, uh, what am I? What am I looking for? You know, you may, you may, you may not know what I'm looking for, but it's easier for me to point you in the direction of what I'm looking for, and when you read it, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about because you would have read it. As to where if you read it and you don't know what I'm talking about, then later on it'll make sense, but. If you haven't read it and you listen to this lecture and then you read it, then you'll know what I'm talking about when you come across it. Does that make sense? Okay. So what what we're going to start is that I'm going to go through the numbers. And I think uh, the first one has 12. Before, uh, what I do in class is I have my students answer these in paragraph form. But we're not going to do that. But I recommend that you do answer them in paragraph form for yourself. So you can have a uh, uh, so you can have a study guide for the exam. And when you have a study guide for the exam or when it comes out in the exam, then you'll know, hey, this is where it's at. And I know what you were talking about. Uh, and I can answer the question satisfactorily. Satisfactorily, I hope I said that right. Right? Okay. So let's start with number one. The question reads: What are some of the push-pull factors that fostered Mexican American immigration into the United States between 1900 and 1930? First of all, we need to know what push-pull means, right? Uh, a push factor is something that pushes people out of their country. In this case, it would be the Mexican Revolution from 1910 to 1920. That is the push factor, okay? A million Mexicans die and a million flee to the United States. Mostly the border states, California, Arizona, okay. Ayon, New Mexico, and Texas. Okay, the main states that they came to, New uh, Texas and Los Angeles. Okay, now, what are the pull factors? Well, the pull factors are promises of a job. Uh, there's no violence here. Okay, and also, uh, we're beginning in the 1930s, we're going to see the rise of agricultural jobs in the United States. So a lot of African Americans are moving north. A lot of Anglo Americans are also moving north to the industrial jobs. So there's a lot of vacancies in the agricultural Southwest. And because there's war in Mexico between 1910 and 1920, a lot of them leave Mexico. Now, here's the deal. If you give me the answer that I just gave you, you're going to get it wrong. You, you need to read each one of these questions I've taken out of that reading that is in there. It's very important they do those readings, okay? What receptions did Mexicans face when they arrived in the United States, both by the government and by the people in the U.S.? Well, I'm not really going to go into a lot of depth on that one because you ought to be able to figure that one out, right? How were they met with the government? When you watch these movies that I posted, right, uh, you'll see how they were treated. 
right? The harvest of loneliness, especially the harvest of loneliness, right? A lot of answers can come from here. And how are the people treated? Well, it's xenophobic, right? Xenophobia, fear of the other. Number three, did their experience differ from those of European countries? Definitely, to an extent, but to another extent, every immigrant that's ever come into the United States has been at one time or another been the scapegoat. The easy thing for Mexicans is it's easier for them to go back. The Chinese, the Germans, the Polish, all those people can't, can't do that, okay? Um, there's also more of them, okay? And the, the border at this time was more porous than it is today. So weaving in and out of the border was not uncommon. What labor fields did migrating Mexicans fill? Was there conflict with other native immigrant groups? Well, of course. You have a depression going on, you know, from 29, and this is immigration 1900 and 1930. The other one is going to take immigration a little bit further, but... What we're talking about here is all of these Anglo-Americans that are leaving places like Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, uh, Southern Colorado, and are going to California and search for jobs, right? It's, it's kind of like if you watch the movie The Grapes of Wrath. They're going to compete with Mexican-Americans, and Mexican-Americans are going to work for less, because they're, they can live on less, okay? That's why they're able to do that. And it's going to create a lot of animosity between Anglos and between Mexican-Americans or newly arrived Mexican immigrants. With, with African-Americans, we do not see those glaring problems, okay? They, we, we don't, okay? Were there plenty of jobs for Mexican immigrants to fill? Yeah, there there was. In the canneries, in the chicken factories, in the fields, anything that was labor, anything that was stoop, S-T-O-O-P, stoop labor, Mexicans could do. Construction, I mean, right around the 1930s and up until after World War II and then well into the 1960s and 70s, we're going to have a housing boom. Somebody needs to build those homes, right? So there were plenty of jobs. The problem was that there was not enough jobs to go around. There was jobs for them to fill, but those jobs could also be filled by Anglo-Americans, and that's going to create a lot of problems between Anglo-Americans and Mexican newly arrived Mexican immigrants. You've got to be able to tell me some of these things, right? I'm giving you just a big, broad brushstrokes on this, okay? Now, again, uh, what were the living arrangements that Mexican Amer immigrants uh, established? Well, uh, as we all know, uh, sometimes if they were all males, they would rent the house, they would live together, or if it was a family, it'd be a family and an extended family, like the sons, the daughters, and if the sons and the daughters got married, if the daughter got married, she would go live with the groom's family. But if a guy, a groom was in the family, then the daughter would come live with him. <clears throat> so we created these extended kinships where sometimes you would have cousins, grandmother. You know, the grandmother usually lived with the oldest son or the one that was better off, the more established one. Uh, we also tended to live in barrios, in communities where other Mexicans lived, and we were able to create a support network that would help everybody, all the Mexicanos that were living in that area. This is very important because we still do this today. You know, to this day, most of us like to move to places where other people like us live. You know, like I remember less than a year ago over here on Crowley Road in I-20, they built a new Michoacana. And I was like so excited because now I could go to a Mexican grocery store instead of just having to go to a Mexican meat market where I could get more competitive prices and the food that we like to eat. Instead of driving all the way to Fiesta, 
okay, because the fiesta is over there on uh, seminary, okay. So we tend to live uh, and seek each other out, okay, uh, even though we sometimes don't like to admit it to ourselves, we still seek each other out. Uh, in addition to how uh, uh, the above communities were perceived by Americans, how did other ethnicities live in the same way? Well, the Germans live in Germantown, the Chinese live in Chinatown, the Russians live in Little Russia, uh, the Italians live in Little Italy. We're not any different than anybody else, you know. We eat strange foods, they eat strange foods, you know. Uh, so we're not that much uh, dissimilar from other cultures. We, you know, birds of a feather flock together. We tend to do that. Now, the following generations a lot, like if you moved in here and you were, you know, you were, you, you were the, you were not born here, but you emigrated here. And now, uh, you had a sister that, uh, uh, was born here she would definitely be a little different and she would be different because um she was born here and because she was born here she would be a lot a lot different she would be more americanized she would go to school she would go to school here at the very beginning with kids that thought just like her unlike you that went to school with kids that had also immigrated okay so the Americanization of it was going to be a lot faster. You know, her chances or your sibling that was born here, their chances of dating somebody outside of the Mexican culture was going to be a lot greater than it would be for you who were not born here. Okay. What were the legal and extra legal mechanisms that were used to limit Mexican exodus into the United States? Well, we have to learn what legal and extra legal is. Legal is the legal way that you can keep people out of the United States and extra legal is extra legal, like above the law, the ways to take and keep people out of the United States. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I want you to find it in your readings and in the movies that I have played, right? I can say, give you an example of Extra legal would be a lynching, would be violence, anything like that. And legal would be anything that the United States passes as a an amendment or a law to keep Americans out. You know, like the revocation of DACA, for example, or the suspension of work visas or something like that. But you have to give me good reasons if I ask you to in the exam. All right. What new biological and geographical stereotypes emerge at this time? Oh my God. <laughs> you know, I, I can't, I can't say enough about the stereotypes and on top of the stereotypes, the, uh, 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 geographical stereotypes that we get. Geographical means that what are those traits that Mexicans have from the area that they come from? You know what I mean? Like Mexicans sometimes make fun of other Mexicans because of the state that they're from and the way that they talk. The way that we Southerners make fun of Yankees or how we make fun of people from California or the way that somebody from the eastern United States says pecans and people in Texas say pecans, you know. Those are the things that we're looking for and those are the things that I want you to find in your readings and in those movies that what are the biological, biological being us, you know, and at the same time geographical. Let me give you uh, a, a, a description of a purely stereotypical uh, stereotype that's bad against Mexicans. Well, Mexicans are sleeping in the middle of the day. Well, who the hell wants to sleep, wants to work during the middle of the day? You take a siesta because that's the hottest part of the day. Or 
I can't believe that that woman is just wearing that dress without a bra. Well, the reason she's probably not wearing a bra is, number one, she's got a baby to breastfeed, and it's easier for her to get out of the dress like that. And number two, it's really hot, okay? Uh, so those are the things that are stereotypes. Now, biological stereotypes is the way that we look, that they, they, they tell us and they single us out because of the way we look be it the shape of our nose, the shape of our eyes, the tone of our skin, you name it, right? Now, what was Americanization? How was it perceived by Mexicans? Do some Mexican immigrants feel that way? Is it a constant struggle even now? Of course it is. It is, all right? Because being Mexican or being a Mexican in the United States is one of the hardest things to do because we're never going to be Mexican enough for the Mexicans and we're never going to be American, quote, enough for the Americans. Now, America is a continent, so we'll say Estadounidense, right, or North American. So we're never going to be North American enough for the Anglo-Americans and we are never going to be Mexican enough for the Mexicans. Why? Because they feel that we are turning our back on Mexico, right? That we're leaving la patria behind, la patria. You know, we're leaving Mexico behind, but it's not true. None of us would choose to live here if none of us, no Mexican that was born in Mexico would choose to live here if he or she or they could make a living in Mexico. A lot of people come here due to violence. A lot of people come out of necessity. You name it. But the bottom line is that nobody leaves their country willingly. It just doesn't happen. I would imagine that life in the United States is a lot more stressful for Mexicans who have come over here than life in Mexico would be if they hadn't, if they didn't have the economic problems that they have in Mexico. Does, does that follow me? If things were good in Mexico, life would be easier in Mexico than it would be in the United States because they wouldn't have to relearn a culture. The, the water, the, the, the money is better, but it takes more to live. And it takes more to keep your children happy, and it takes more to assimilate, okay? There's, there's a lot more involved in it, okay? Why did McCary Williams denunciate repatriation, and how can it be compared to DACA returnees? Okay, you have to read a little bit about McCary Williams in the other unit, and this is this one's going to be kind of hard for those of you that were not with me in the first semester, but it's okay. McCary Williams was the first Anglo American who ever came out to bat for Mexican Americans. That oh, came out and destroyed all the stereotypes that were formed against us that we were lazy and that, that we were thieves and that we were a monolithic culture. Okay. For a long time, we have been told that Mexicans are monolithic. We're very happy if we have our bironga, if we have our a little bit of money, and you know, I'll do it tomorrow, mañana. That's not true. Don't that is just just because your parents sometimes may be that way. It's just that they're tired of working. Just because they're complacent doesn't mean that they're happy with their complacency. Okay. And just because we Mexicans appear to be monolithic on the outside does not mean that we're monolithic on the inside. And I'm going to give you a perfect example of why we're not monolithic, okay? Quinceañeras, birthdays, baptism, Easter celebrations, Christmas, El Día de la Guadalupe. We're not a black and white culture, okay? Mexicans are not like that, especially now with the increased, not complete, but the increased acceptance of homosexuality within the Mexican-American culture, with the identification of African-Americans being Afro-Mexicans, with the acceptance of, 
you know, more Mexican-American young ladies marrying African-Americans and Anglo-Americans, that is diversification and that is an increased tolerance. You know, not all Mexicans are Catholic. Some are Baptist. I've known Methodists. I'm a lot of Mexicans that are Jehovah Witnesses. If we were monolithic, one single culture, we would all be the same. So we're not monolithic, okay? We're not as, we're not as, no, I'm going to say that our diversity is actually more genuine than it is in a lot of other cultures because we're not following cultures because it's a trend. We're following cultures. We're following fashion. We're following food. We're following all these things because that is what we like. If that wasn't true, then we wouldn't have a Gran Plaza. I mean, that, when I came to Fort Worth 20 years ago, that was an abandoned mall. We went there and they told us, what are you doing going there? That is a horrible place. You can get shot there. You know? Now, the idea is, is that whatever culture we are, we bring with us. And when we do, we take a little bit of ours and theirs and we start another culture, which is not monolithic. Okay? So you're going to have... Now, I'm telling you, if on any of these answers you repeat or regurgitate any of what you're telling me, I will not give you any credit. You've got to have to come up with this stuff in your own words, okay? Now, that was just on Kerry McWilliams and how he moved us away from being monolithic, okay? Now, let's talk about repatriation, okay? So, let's say, for example, that your father is invited to work in the United States, okay? And he works here for 15 years, okay, under a government contract. And all of a sudden, the new president that comes in says, that's it, I'm going to end this contract. Send all these Mexicans back to Mexico. That is repatriation. So what you're telling me is that you allowed this individual to live in the United States of America for 15 years. He got married here has children here and now you're going to you're going to separate them because the children are US citizens he married his wife here which is US citizen now you're going to send him back to Mexico that's repatriation you cannot do that to him it's like daca students what if you have a daca student that's been a daca student from the very beginning as now is on year 4 okay yeah they knew that this was going to end right the deal is you can't just tell them from one day to another, hey, it's over, bro. You're going back. You can't do that. <laughs> that you know, that's like getting fired, you know. like That's like getting fired from a, a cushy job. You know, one day you're working, the next day you're fired. It's like, well, wait a minute. What am I going to do? You know, can you, can you give me a two weeks notice or something like that? So repatriation, you have to know what repatriation means. And then I want you to tell me how it was applied to Mexicans during World War One, during World War II, during the Bracero program, and of course during DACA, okay? Lastly, how did the Mexican government deal with a flight of Mexican labor? Well, flight means how did they deal with the loss of labor? Well, they didn't really want the labor to leave. So what they did is that they made deals with the United States that these immigrants that were coming to work in the United States were getting paid half in the United States and half being paid in Mexico with Mexican banks holding the money in escrow until they came back to Mexico. Well, some of them never came back. And these Mexican banks kept the money. As a matter of fact, they still have the money. Okay? A lot of these Mexicans that were re repatriated were sent back to Mexico before being paid wages that they had been owed by the government. And these accounts are still there. And they are worth millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay? And if you can prove that your grandfather was a bracero and he wasn't fully paid his wages then you as an heir to your grandfather deserve to get that money paid, okay? So those are the things that I'm trying to say. It's like, you know, 
Mexico was not completely happy with this labor leaving. They were happy to see some people leave because the government couldn't take care of them, but eventually they wanted them to come back with American dollars because American dollars were going to stimulate the Mexican economy, okay? For those of you that have parents that live, still have houses in Mexico, you know that when they go home or they send money home, the U.S. dollar is almighty. You know what I mean? I mean, if you don't believe me, you know, have pesos and have American money and offer it to, to a, a merchant, they're going to take the U.S. currency right away. And once the bank gets a hold of that U.S. currency, they're not going to give it back to you unless they absolutely have to, okay? So, with all of that said, this is a conclusion of this, of, of this, you know, uh, study guide one. And what I need for you to do is that I need for all of you, and let me go ahead and close this, I need for you to, uh, and let me see if I can open this without messing this up, I need for all of you, no, I closed it, so uh, I know you can still see me, but um, the idea is, and I'm going to, uh, hopefully I can open it up here, and of course it closed again, but you can still see me, give me one second, all right, um, Give me one second. I'm over here. I'm still here. I'm still here. I know you can see me. But... Immigration 1B. Okay. Okay. All right, so I want you to watch the Harvest of Loneliness. Why? Uh, it's just, it's important that you read that. I mean, that you watch that movie. Mass media, Chicanos, Chicanos and Mexicans in the Great Depression, very important. Now, I want you to watch Emma Tenayuca because later on, I'm going to have a mini lecture about Emma Tenayuca, Dolores Huerta, and Cesar Chavez because they were labor agitators, okay? This is both immigration and labor. Latino Americans, uh, prejudice and pride, and then you have your readings. Don't worry so much about the term list, okay? I want you to worry more about the study guide. And then we have one right here, the Bracero program and the role of women in Chicano history. So you got one, two, three, four, five videos to watch, okay? They're all important, and you, you better watch them, or it's not going to go well for you, okay? I promise that. Uh, and then I will give you a separate lecture, a separate mini lecture on Emma Tenayuca, Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, and Jovita Idar. Uh, we often give Cesar Chavez too much credit, when in reality, we should give a lot of credit to Dolores Huerta, and more credit to Emma Tenayuca and uh, Jovita Idar. Emma Tenayuca was 30 years before Cesar Chavez, and Jovita Idar was before Emma Tenayuca. She was in the 1870s, and she was a journalist, and Emma Tenayuca was a pecan sheller, and then Dolores Huerta was a partner of Cesar Chavez, and they were involved in labor. The reason they were involved in labor was because uh, they were all about the movement of better treatment in the fields to individuals that were working there, just like Tenayuca was, and and Jovita Idar was a journalist that wanted everybody to see how Mexicans were really treated, okay? I don't like to put Cesar Chavez in with other Mexican-American civil rights leaders because Cesar Chavez was all about agricultural migrant workers and great pickers in California and was really just focused on in California. Yes, some workers did take some of his ideas and put them into effect in Texas, 
in New Mexico and Arizona, but he was not the driving force in the in the civil rights movements in California. I mean, in uh, I'm sorry, in uh, uh, New Mexico or in Arizona or in um, Texas. In Texas, it was Jose Angel Gutierrez. Uh, and some other individuals that later on that come out, like Hector Gutierrez and uh, Hector Gonzalez, I'm sorry, Maldev, uh, Lulac. In, in Colorado, we're going to have individuals like Corky Gonzalez. In New Mexico, we're going to have Reyes Lopez Tijerina. And really in Arizona, it, it not a lot materializes there. I mean, it kind of just is the stalemate of, of civil rights, but... It's just you know, you don't have Rey Lopez Tijerina and Jose Angel Gutierrez and uh, um, Corky Gonzalez until the 1960s, and you don't have uh, 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 Lulac until the 1930s and after World War II, when you begin to have this movement of Lulac attorneys and doctors that really begin to. What's going to happen later on is that instead of focusing so much on migrant workers, they're going to leave that to Julio Cesar Chavez. Some Mexican-American civil rights leaders are going to focus on identity, like the Chicano movement, and then others are going to focus on, we need to desegregate schools. If we can bring forth desegregation, then through desegregation, we will get more Mexicans educated and more Mexican-Americans will become doctors, attorneys, senators, congressmen, and we will change uh, policy. With the change of policy, you don't have to worry that much about everything else because if you change policy, then you pretty much outlaw uh, discrimination. Does everybody follow me? My father did not have the same right that I had to go to college, and my grandfather didn't. My children are going to have much more of a right to go to college than I did. So, you know, perhaps instead of them being professors in a high school, I mean at a college, they can become a congressman or a cabinet minister or something like that. That is only going to happen with desegregation. It's, it's, it's not going to happen so much through uh, activism in a, let's say, a search for identity and the recognition of us as brown people with people that have clout, okay? It's not as a militant a struggle, I would say, as, and as, you know, yes, getting you know, desegregated is then going to help the children of migrant workers because they're going to have an access to a better education and they're going to be able to uplift themselves from migrant work. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with migrant working, okay? It's work. It's un trabajo muy duro. But, you know, it, we all want better for our children. So that's, in a sense, what I'm looking at, that... Remember that the Constitution does not guarantee that everybody get a bachelor's degree or that everybody be successful, but it does guarantee that everybody have equal access to the things that can or will make us successful. Always remember that, okay? Always remember that. And the way that I see it, the way that I like to explain it to my students is me and my brother-in-law, Robert, are going to a baseball game. My brother-in-law is uh, very tall. How tall? I would imagine he's probably uh, like six something, like six two or something like that, right? So we go to the baseball game and he pays. We are going to stand in the standing only behind the fence. The problem is, is that the fence is five and a half feet tall. And guess what? I'm five and a half feet tall, right? So I pay the $20 and I have a milk carton, a milk uh, box with me. And, and the guy says, what do you want that milk box for? And I said, well, I'm going to use it to stand on the 
milk box so I can look over the fence so I can watch the baseball game. And he says, no, nah, you can't do that. Then he tells Robert, give me your $20. And Robert, my brother-in-law, just comes in. He's 6'2". He's already of the fence. It's going to be down here. He's going to watch the game just fine. Then I tell the guy, well, if I have to look at the baseball game through the little crack, then I should only have to pay $10 or $5 because I'm paying $20, and that's not equal. That's what equal access means. The guy would probably say, well, you know what? Go ahead and take the milk cart. I don't care. That's the way that he would make it equal, that he would tell me, hey, don't worry about taking that. We have little stools for you, okay? Or if you move around, there's little squares where you can look through and you'll be okay, right? That would be equality, an accommodation for my height. Not giving me an accommodation for my height and making me pay the $20 to look over, to try and stand on my tippy toes and barely look up over a five and a half foot fence would be discrimination, right? It, it, I mean, I'm not being a snowflake. It's just discrimination. It's like, right, when you want to sit in the first row at a concert, you know, you want to sit first row to watch uh, Hamilton, you're probably going to pay about $4,000 for the tickets. But if you want to sit up here in the nosebleed section, which is still really not that far, you can still see good. You can see it on the screen. You know, you're probably 50 yards away, but there's probably 3,000 people between you and you. Yeah, but the tickets up there are only $17. Do you see what I mean? That's an accommodation. You're sitting farther, you pay less, right? The closer you, or if you want to sit in the balcony, that's over all these people over here and be right over it to have an overhead view. It may not be $4,000, but it sure as hell isn't going to be seventeen. dollars It may be two hundred, dollars And that's what we're talking about, about equality. And that's what a lot of the LULACers are going to look. A lot of these individuals that are going to come in, these labor activists are saying, look, you want us to pick pecans by hand because that's the way they come out the best? We're okay, but you can't pay us three, you know, you can't pay us 14 cents an hour. You, you got to give us a little bit more than that, especially when you're paying white workers 34 cents an hour and you're paying us 14 cents an hour just because of the color of our skin. Uh, right now, women make 84 cents for every dollar that uh, a man makes. So that is wage discrimination, okay? That, that, that's all. You got to look at these things, right? You have to look at these things because these things are real. And a lot of times some of us say, well, I'm not really going to worry about it because I really need this job. And that's where we go wrong is that we really need this job. And that's not what it should be all about. You know, it, it, it should be about equality and equal access. All right. Well, I'm sorry I went on that huge rant, but it's all going to tie in together at the end. And I wanted you all to understand what e equality meant or access to what everybody else has. OK, we're going to talk about later on. We talk about segregation in schools, separate but equal and all that other stuff. OK. Now, for now, I want you to watch this video and watch some of these movies. We've got exams coming up here shortly, so you better move it. I will record the next video tomorrow and post it for you. So, first of all, I want you to be kind to each other, and I want you to wear your mask. Okay? You all take care. Cuídense bien. Y nos vemos a la próxima. We'll see you next time.